I appreciate the opportunity to uh, stand up here and bring a lesson, and I appreciate uh, Ryder for reading that passage of Scripture uh, for us. We're not going to be spending a lot of time in Isaiah this evening, um, but I do think that's a, a good companion Scripture to go along with what we're going to talk about. Uh, I want to talk at the, look at the parable of the prodigal son, as it's often known today. So if you would, turn your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 15. Luke, chapter 15, beginning there in verse 11. And I think the prodigal son, uh, as we often refer to it, is, is one of the most well-known, um, maybe one of our, our most popular, if, if that's a term you would use with a, a parable, um, but, but I think the reason it's, it's so well known and so, um, so often thought of is it really is, it's a timeless story. It's a timeless story that's been repeated again and again throughout cultures and throughout history uh, of a son, a rebellious son, leaving home and returning uh, humbled and penitent. Um, I think that's something that we can all, in, in some aspect, in some measure, relate to. As a matter of fact, let's try something fun. If, raise your hand if you left home almost as soon as you could, after you turned 18, graduated high school, whatever. Ra raise your hand if you left home just as soon as you pretty much could. Jeff's raising two hands. <laughs> He left a minute before he was allowed to. <laughs> and keep your hand up if, if it went exactly like you thought it would, if it went exactly the way you wanted it to. Right, I, I think we can all understand that. I think we, we've all gone through some measure of this. But, but this parable tells us a story uh, of someone who, who rejected his father, rejected um, the, the things that, that he was expected of, and, and he wanted to go out and, and to find his own way. And he found the world to be the cold and cruel place that it is. So let's turn over to the book of Luke, chapter 15, and start there in verse 11. We'll get a big drink of water, and then we'll read it. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me, and he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to, them, said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. 
It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this, your brother, was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. A parable there of, really, two sons. And so often we refer to this as the parable of the prodigal son, but I think it's more accurately titled uh, the parable of the two sons. And we'll talk a little more about that later. But there's, there's lots of different phases of this story, and I want to go through it kind of um, section by section and talk about the things that, that happen here, this, this journey that this son makes, both physically and spiritually, and talk about uh, particularly the spiritual applications that we can, we can learn from that. And the first thing that happens here, the first <coughs> segment of this journey is the departure. And he, 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 he wants to take his inheritance. And we, and we know from, from Jewish tradition and custom that the eldest son, which he was the youngest son, um, the eldest son was to receive two-thirds of, of the, the property of his father. And, and the younger son or sons would, would divvy up the remainder. And this, this son, he wanted to take what was his, and he, and he wanted to go. And, and I think it's amazing to think about what he's really saying there. This is typically would have, would have come to him when his father died, even if his mother was still living, which is a little different than, than the way things would go today. But he's saying to his father, Father, I, I wish you were dead. He's saying to his father, I wish you would just die so I could have what's coming to me. And I could go on and do what I want to do. He's rejecting his father. He's rejecting the authority and the position of his father. And saying, I I just want to go and do what I want to do. And so often it is with us as we reject God. As we reject the authority of God. And we certainly live in a world today that absolutely rejects not only the authority of God, but the very existence of God. And so we live in a world today full of anger and open rebellion and disdain toward God. But it's interesting to see the father's reaction here because and no doubt he attempted maybe to dissuade him from, from this thing that he wanted to do, but, but he saw his son's... Uh, position, he saw that he was adamant about it, and he decided that he had to let him go and to make his own choices. The father seemed to know that he was going to have to learn some lessons the hard way. And this brings up the idea of free will. And free will has been God's position with mankind from the very beginning. We go back and look at the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Um, did they have a choice? Did they have a choice in what they did? God gave them all these things. He, he gave them this garden, this beautiful place to live, and he gave them one simple command. He said, just don't eat of this one fruit. He gave them a choice. Israel had a choice to obey God. I often think about the Israelites and their journey when I think about the, uh, the prodigal son here and the journey that he goes on. You know, you think about the Israelites as they come out of Egypt, they're wandering in the wilderness, and, and they cry out to God saying, well, we just, wish, we just wish we could have stayed back in Egypt. I mean, sure, we were slaves, but we didn't have to eat manna every day. Um, that same sort of, of, of petty rebellion we see there in, in, in the Israelites. And with us today, we have a choice of whether or not we want to obey God, whether or not we want to follow Christ. But we have this problem with sin. We have this problem with sin as we read about, uh, as a uh, writer read for us in, in Isaiah chapter 59, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or is ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. 
Our sin, our rebellion against God is what creates a separation for us. For the prodigal son here, this was a, a literal and physical separation, but it was also a spiritual and emotional separation from his father. Just as our sin separates us from God. Yes, God is ready and willing and able to redeem us, to save us. He wants to be close to us, but our sin, our rebellion has separated us from him. And we all have this problem. As we read in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So back to the prodigal here, the son. He's, it, we note that he takes everything. He, he was only there a few days probably to sell whatever he could sell, uh, to get money for his journey. But he took everything. He, he, he's very much creating a whole and true and complete separation from his family. He doesn't want to have any remnant tying him back to his home. You know, when a little kid gets mad at mom and dad and says, you know, they're, they're going to run away, they're, you know, they're going to take a, a toy, maybe a snack, get a juice box, they're going to run away, right? And they leave most things behind. They still have all these ties home and very quickly realize uh, how much they, they miss home. But this prodigal, he's leaving nothing. He's separating himself from his father, from his family, from his home. And he's made up his mind that he's never going to return to this place. And it says he went to a distant land. The prodigal went to a distant land. He wanted to get as far away from home as he possibly could. Didn't want anyone to know who he was or where he came from. And didn't want any way maybe for his family to be able to find him. Makes me think a lot about Jonah. What did Jonah want to do when he rebelled against God? When God asked him to go to Nineveh and to, and to preach to them. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah foolishly thought, I'm going to go away from the presence of the Lord. How'd that work out for him? Not real good. Jonah believed that he, if he got on this ship, if he went away to Tarshish, and Tarshish is a long way, um, there's some debate about where exactly that is. It may be uh, in Carthage, which would be North Africa, maybe Spain. It's uh, not sure, but it's a long way. This wasn't, you know, the next town over. Uh, he, but he had this desire to run away from God, just as his son had this desire to run away and, and trying to run away from authority, trying to run away from consequences. And in keeping with this total rebellion, he squanders his inheritance on reckless living. Now, in verse 14, um, it tells us that he spent everything he had on reckless living. We know from uh, his, his brother's accusations uh, what this reckless living constituted. This wasn't just that Maybe he was a little um, loose with the credit card and, and, and spent too much money on, on books and, and, and takeout. Um, his, his brother says that, tells his father that he wasted his property on prostitutes. We see, we see that he's gone out. He is, he is, he is living it up in, in, in the worldly sense. He is wasting all this money and all this uh, inheritance that he has on, on sinfulness, on, on rebellion against righteousness and against God. <coughs> but as so often occurs with this kind of rebellion, with this, with this rejection of, of rules and of, of what's expected, there were consequences, and they were unanticipated consequences. The rule of, of unintended consequences comes for everyone. No doubt he did not count on this famine. No doubt that he, 
He did not have that in his, in his plan. He may have even reasoned that no matter what happens, you know, when he runs out of money, you know, this, this place he's gone to, I'm, I'm sure he didn't pick the, the worst place to go to, like the, the most destitute place. We're sure, I'm, I'm sure he probably picked a place that was, that was pretty uh, happening at the time. And so he thought, well, it's a good economy, I'll get a job, and, and everything will be fine. But after he runs out of money, the famine occurs. And he finds himself all alone. He finds himself broke. He finds himself alone. And he finds himself in a strange place all of a sudden. This place where not long ago he was, he was living it up. And no doubt when he had money... He had friends. But now he finds himself penniless, destitute, with no way to support himself, no way to get home. And so he says he began to be in need. And we read as he takes this job, Um, feeding pigs, he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Where were all these friends that he had? Where were all these people who no doubt surrounded him when he was living it up? Proverbs has a lot to say about friendship. Proverbs chapter 18 and beginning verse 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 17. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. This prodigal son here, he he had a family. He had a brother. He had true friendship and companionship at home. And he gave all that away for whatever it was he was seeking in this strange land. And now in in his time of need, he finds himself with no one. Have you ever stopped to consider the support that you have when you are a member of the Lord's church? I think we see this week, this past week, a lot of people over in, in the western part of the state are, are feeling that. I think all of us here have felt that at times. We, we felt that love and that support. You know, we've, got, we've got brethren here and brothers and sisters who, I mean, just try to get them to not help you. I dare you. You can't. You can't stop them. And it's an amazing thing what God has created among his people. And what a terrifying thing it is to be in the world alone without that. And the prodigal here, he feels that. He begins to feel the desperation, but yet he's still trying to find his own solution. He's still trying to find his own way out. It says he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Now consider our audience here. Who is Jesus speaking to? He's speaking to Jews. And there is absolutely nothing more disgusting, more defiling, more abominable to the Jewish people than pigs. And so for someone of... Jewish ancestry to be feeding pigs, to be in fields with pigs, to be near pigs. That's the lowest of the low. That's as low as you can get. And in this desperation, the shame begins to take hold. So he's tried to work his way out of his problem by degrading himself 
And yet, he's still hungry. And he longs to be fed. He, he realizes that the pigs are eating better than he is. How often do we try to keep people from finding out our mistakes? How often do we try to work out our own solution to our problems before we seek help? Proverbs talks about that as well. Proverbs 11 and uh, verse 14, where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. Just because the consequences begin to hit us doesn't always mean that we're ready to accept what we've done, ready to repent, ready to seek help, to seek God. And often we have to be patient with those who, who we desperately want to, to seek God, to seek help, and to return to Him. But then comes the beginning of redemption, and redemption begins here in the mire. I think I want to print that on some t-shirts. Redemption begins in the mire. The first step here is he's got to come to grips with the reality of his sin. He's as low as he can get in this pig pen. He's alone, he's broke, and he's far away from those who love him. And he begins to understand the severity and the gravity of it. And it makes me think of David's feelings that he puts in Psalm chapter 32. And uh, we'll begin there in verse 3. This is a Psalm of David. I, I don't know that this is about his sin with Bathsheba, but I'd say there's a good chance. Verses 3 and 4, he says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. David felt the weight of his sin in that, in that time, just as the prodigal here in his lowest moments felt it as well. And he begins to realize that the lowest servant in his father's house is living in luxury compared to him. Verse 17 says, But when, I ca when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? And so he realizes that the only thing he can do is to go back to his father, to repent of what he has done and return home. And we can imagine this journey. We don't know how far he traveled, but we know that it was a distant land. And we know that in his desire to be separated from home, he went probably as far as he could. And that was when he was in good health. Now he is in terrible shape. He's hungry, and now he's got this, before he was hungry, he was living in, in debauchery, so no doubt um, his body is in, in just in shambles. This is the beginning of his true repentance. He is turning away from the place and the things that brought him low, and he is going back to his father. He is going back to his home. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 says, As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Godly grief produces repentance in us because we realize the horror and the agony of our sin, whereas worldly grief produces death because we're just upset we got caught. We're just upset the things didn't go the way we wanted. This godly grief that this prodigal son is feeling brought him back to where he needed to be. And so we see after this, after this long journey, we see him approaching his home. And he's got this speech prepared. He's, he's rehearsed this speech, and no doubt 
all the way on this journey in his mind. He, he's, he's rehearsing this speech and what he's going to say to his father so that his father understands how earnest and how desperately he longs to be just one of his servants. Just, just, let, me be, just let me be that. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I understand that. I understand what I've done. And I don't deserve your love. Just let me be a servant. Verse 20, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. His father didn't just happen to see his return. His father was waiting for him to return. His father was looking for him. His father was watching that horizon, hoping to see his silhouette. What a beautiful picture this is of God. What a beautiful picture this is of our Father's love, that He is is always waiting. He is always hopeful that we will return to Him. The Father saw the shame in His face. He saw the brokenness in His spirit. And He knew that this was no longer the rebellious hateful child that left him so long ago. He knew that this was truly his son. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is patiently waiting on his children to return to him. He is patiently waiting on us to put aside our our greed and our pride and our arrogance and our lusts to come to him. Just as the father here didn't even wait to hear what his son had to say. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven And before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And he cuts him off right there. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. Let's understand what these things mean. He kissed him. The verb that's used there literally means to kiss him multiple times. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, See what love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. He didn't rebuke him. He didn't, he didn't give him a lecture about what an awful son he was about what an awful thing he had done, about how wasteful he had been, probably saw in his face and in his countenance that he already understood all that and certainly heard in his voice saying, I am no longer worthy to be called your son, that he understood the gravity and the ramifications of what he had done. He wasn't treated with reproach and punishment, but he was treated with unconditional love and acceptance. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The father knew that his son had returned broken, but he returned broken changed. And so he began to restore him. He put the robe on him, which gave him status. The robe being a a symbol of his status as as someone in in the the family, in in the household. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, but you are a chosen race, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He put a ring on his hand, a ring being a symbol of authority. He's not just somebody he's welcoming back home, but he's, he's making him a part of the family. He's giving him authority within the family, just as we have been given authority in the kingdom of God through Christ Jesus. And he put sandals on his feet. And we understand from the custom of the time, only members of the family would have worn sandals. Servants would not have had those. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We have been redeemed and are made sons of and daughters of the Most High. Just as this son was redeemed by his father when he came home, and he was not only welcomed home, but he was restored to his place in the family. He was restored to his honor among his, his family and his, his household. No, he did not deserve it. No, there was nothing that he had done, nothing that he could do to be deserving of that place. He certainly couldn't pay back what was, what was lost. He certainly couldn't do anything to, to fix the damage that he had done. But his father was so excited that he was alive. that he even had the opportunity to restore him. And he did. But again, this parable is not merely a parable of one son. It's a parable of two sons. And so as this celebration is ongoing, his older son, his brother, was in the field this is the older son out in the field, steadfast for his father. And it says, as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And the servant told him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And of course, the, the older brother, the older son here, he was excited, right? He was excited. My brother has returned He's alive. Thank goodness he's okay. And he went and joined the celebration, right? No. No, he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And how many of you haven't had one of your children ask you why you never gave them a young goat? But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. This is our idea of fairness, right? This is our worldly understanding of fairness, of justice, is he gets punishment for what he has done, and I deserve blessings, and I deserve adulation for all of my faithful service. I deserve to be honored, and he deserves to be punished. That's, that's us, right? That's, that's how we look at the world. That's how we look at everyone who's not as righteous as us. And of course, we know that Jesus here is, is speaking directly to his audience here. He is speaking to the Pharisees and scribes who were grumbling at him at the beginning of, of chapter 15. And we could go on and on into all the different things that he's talking about there, and, and, and we've certainly examined that in other classes and things here before. 
But for us as Christians today, for us sitting here right now, not really dealing with this uh, Pharisee, scribe situation, Jesus is still speaking to us. So often we can still be the older brother who never quite, never quite forgets the things that one of our brothers or sisters has done in the past. Maybe we never quite get over your past life. Do we treat those who haven't maybe grown up in the church or maybe have some things in the past that, that maybe we don't have? Do we treat them a little differently? Was Paul less of a Christian because of his persecution of the church? Was his salvation less complete because of his sin? Jesus obviously knew this was an important problem. He spoke other parables about it. The parable of the workers in the vineyard where we have uh, the laborers who come into the vineyard at different parts of the day and the master gives them all the same reward. Or the parable of the two sons where one son is, is told by his father to go and, and work in the vineyard and he refuses, but afterward changed his mind and went. Very much the same, you know, kind of the same story here as the prodigal, just, just summarized much shorter. And the other son said, I go, but he did not go. Who, and Jesus asked him, who did the will of the father? And we know it's the one who initially refused, but came around. So often we want to be like this older brother and sit in judgment uh, of those who maybe decide that mm, maybe I'm not going to talk to that person about their salvation. Maybe they're not worthy to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Christ died for our sins. Christ, being the righteous one, being the holy one, beyond anything that we could ever comprehend or accomplish, died for our sins. And he did that, that we could be reconciled to God. God has given us an amazing gift. But he wants to redeem us. He wants to welcome us into his household. He wants to give us a robe and put a ring on our hand and sandals on our feet because the son, which was lost, which was dead, is alive again and is found. It doesn't matter if you come to Christ when you're 10 or 100. That same celebration is what God wants. God is just as excited to have his child come home. I think all of us, when we look deep into ourselves, see at least a little bit of the prodigal somewhere in us, somewhere in our past, hopefully, but perhaps somewhere in your present. I hope this, this parable, this lesson, and this understanding of what God wants to do for us, that God is that loving Father who every day is looking out at the horizon hoping to see you coming. Thank God for that. If there's anything that we can do for you this evening, if you need to come to God in repentance, realizing the condition of your soul, 
Please don't wait. Come forward as together we stand and sing.